Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. My name is Jessica McLindsay. I'm with Southern Maryland Resource Conservation and Development down here in Leonardtown, down in St. Mary's County. Um, our office is focused on promoting the people and the environment in harmony in Southern Maryland. And one of the ways that we do that is through education and outreach. And that's what we're all here for today. Uh, with us today is Carrie Wickstead. She's a naturalist with more than 15 years of experience studying the flora and fauna of Maryland. She currently works for a nonprofit focused on connecting state wildlife agencies and partners on national topics pertaining to amphibians, reptiles, and invasive species. She has previously worked for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and has taught classes for Nature Forward's Natural History Field Studies Program. And before I turn it over to Carrie, I just wanted to do a few quick Zoom housekeepings. Um, we've all been using Zoom for years, but for those of us that haven't and are new to Zoom, just please remember to keep yourself on mute while Carrie is presenting. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat in the bottom. We'll be monitoring the chat and Carrie will have time at the end for questions. And if you choose to be on screen, just please remember to keep it business appropriate while we are all here together. So thank you for joining us and Carrie, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here tonight and talking about a favorite topic of mine, bats. All right. Well, <clears throat> welcome to Beneficial Bats. Um, my name again is Carrie Wickstead. So I'm a, coming to you as a volunteer naturalist tonight. And I love bats, um, even though we're kind of getting at the tail end of bat season here in our area. And before I jump into you know, information about local bats, I figured I wanted to give just a little bit of introduction on what exactly is a bat and a little bit more about, um, about bats and their benefits and everything, because unfortunately there are a lot of misconceptions about bats out there. So to start off, bats are in this order called Chiroptera, which literally translates to hand wing. And so here's the skeleton of a bat, and you can see this is their hand, and that is their wing. So that's where they uh, they fall in in that natural order of things. A lot of people mistake bats as flying rodents. So rodents are in a completely different group of mammals, and um, technically, bats are the only flying mammals that are out there. There's some uh, other mammal species like our local flying squirrels. They technically don't fly, they glide. <laughs> bats are the only ones that can fully fly themselves, which is pretty um, unique, you know, because most other flying animals like birds and things like that have hollow bones and adaptations to make them light in weight. But bats just really have this large surface area for their wings to be able to sustain their, their weight. So because there's so many bat species around the world and they can live in very different habitats, they eat a lot of various foods to survive. And so the majority of bats around the world eat insects. So that includes about 70% of bats. And all of our bats in Maryland and, and here on the East Coast are insectivores, they're eating insects. In other areas of the world, there are some bats that eat fruit. And um, with doing that, they help disperse seeds. So that uh, accounts for almost 20% of bats worldwide, about 6%. About 6% um, drink nectar. We've got 3.5% that eat small mammals, including uh, other bat species, and some of them eat fish and frogs. You have 2% that eat fish, and only three species in the entire world drink blood. And so that's another misconception. People think that all bats drink blood, but it's just a, a very, very tiny number of bat species. So as I said, um, bats eat a lot of things and they also help disperse seeds. So those, um, those fruit eating bats are responsible for seed dispersal in a lot of those tropical areas. And in some areas, those bats can account for almost 90% of the reforestation that happens. We also have bats that are out there um, helping to pollinate different plants. So um, bananas are a bat pollinated plant. So the bananas that we eat are all clones, the Cavendish variety, the wild bananas are things that are being pollinated by bats. 
For those of you of age, you can also raise a glass to the bats because they help pollinate agave, which gives us tequila. <laughs> so uh, another important uh, food that they help to uh, um, pollinate. And then on the bottom, I've got some of our bats eating insects. And so again, all of our bats in Maryland are insectivores. And it's estimated that a single colony of 150 big brown bats can eat up to 33 million or more rootworms um, in one summer. So that's a lot of insects that they're eating. And it's estimated across the United States that bats account for about $3 billion of pest control services. So really, really important um, in that regard. So one topic that people often talk about relating to bats are their ability to eat mosquitoes. I'm gonna break your heart a little bit. So there's one widely cited study that found that bats can eat anywhere from 600 to 1,000 mosquitoes per hour. Unfortunately, that number is not sustained. And this was actually a diet study of just, you know, how much energy they were expending to eat mosquitoes. Um, and so they didn't give those bats in the experiment any other food choices. So most bat species, if they have a choice, um, they were, you know, between something like a beetle or a moth versus a mosquito, they're probably going to go after the larger prey. I always say beetles and moths are kind of like Big Macs, and then a mosquito is kind of like a French fry. And if you've got to eat anywhere from a third of your body weight to sometimes almost your full body weight in insects every night, you're going to go after those Big Macs because that's where you have to spend the least amount of energy. So obviously the size of the bat matters. So species like our little brown bats, which are some of our smaller bat species around here, they're going to have more you know, eat more mosquitoes than something larger like our hoary bats or our big brown bats. So overall, insectivorous bats do eat mosquitoes, but they might not significantly control populations. But they're helping with a lot of other things, particularly a lot of those agricultural pests. And so the loss of bat species is going to become a problematic for some of those pest species. So bats are part of the second largest group of mammals in the world, second only to rodents. And there are over 1,300 species of bats around the world. And as I said earlier, they, um, they eat different things and you can see that reflected in their faces. So I just wanted to show you some bats that are not local, but really, really cool. So um, species like our large flying foxes, um, these actually don't echolocate. They have these large noses and those big eyes and, and they look a lot like foxes. And that's because they use their sense of sight and their smell to get around to find fruits and other plants to eat and pollinate. We have nectar feeding bats with extremely long tongues. So some of them are also referred to as hummingbird bats because they uh, act a lot like hummingbirds the way that they flutter around those nectar plants. Um, in Central America, there's this really cool bat, the greater bulldog bat, and you can probably see where it gets its name with that you know, bulldog-like face. So this is a species that eats frogs and fish. So this is a medium-sized bat that you can find in, in tropical areas. And then there are also these really wild-looking bats like this wrinkle-faced bat. I love this bat. Um, this is a species, this is actually a male. So the males have much more wrinkled face and they actually fold up their wrinkles and it makes it look like they have a, a furry mustache and they do off to show do that to show off to the females. And you see all those folds on its face. Well, this bat has a very short face and lots of folds because it needs a strong bite force to eat hard fruits. And then while it's eating the fruits, its face is almost like a built-in juicer. So um, all those folds let the juice from all the fruit kind of run down into its mouth. So <laughs> quite the adaptation there. So around 70% of the bats in around the world echolocate. And, um, and so all of our bats in the area are echolocating bats. Echolocation is a process by which animals emit these high-pitched sound waves that echo back to them and help them locate different objects. So animals use echolocation to navigate, to hunt, and to identify other species and to avoid obstacles. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
And um, so this adaptation is extremely helpful for animals that need to get around um, at night or in hard to see environments. So you might be familiar with echolocation with um, bats, but also dolphins echolocate, and even these small mammals called shrews echolocate. And they're, they're doing that to be able to essentially see in the dark underground. So echolocating bats generate pulses of ultrasound via their larynx. So that's down there, their voice box there. And they emit that sound through either their mouth or their nose. So some bats, like this weird bat down here, this horseshoe bat is actually one that emits the sound through its nose. And um, the sound is emitted at a high frequency, and this is much higher than what we can hear. So we can't hear echolocating bats while they're out there hunting and all of that, but other animals can hear them depending on what pitches they can hear. So to do this, they've got these uh, specialized ears. The big part of their ear is called the pinnae, and then this little part of their ear is called the tragus. And they move that pinnae and tragus around to be able to hear those echolocation calls. And a lot of bat species have over 20 muscles in that just to be able to move their ears and, uh, and hear those sound waves as they're going out and hunting. So here's a quick video that I'm just going to share and hopefully the sound will come across too. But this is an echolocating bat. You see how it's kind of, um, it starts making those noises really, really quick as it's getting closer. And the other thing to pay attention to is essentially how they use the bottom flat of their tail um, and, and, you know, use it as almost like a basket to catch those insects like those moths. And this is happening really, really fast. So as mentioned earlier, humans can't hear um, echolocation calls that bats make. So bats also make other noises where they communicate with one another and we can hear those noises. We just can't hear those echolocation calls. So there are a lot of cool devices that actually help to bring those echolocation calls down to the range of human hearing. So in the research world, we use these things like these anabat detectors that create these sonograms and you can tell by the different signatures what bat is calling, but they've also designed um, some really cool detectors that you can actually plug up to your phone. So this is one from Wildlife Acoustics, and you can use this and you can see the sonogram on your phone, and it even has um, built-in um, identification software for those bats as well. So moving along just to some other cool bat species before I get into local species, I wanted to talk about the largest bat in the world, um, just because it's just such a, a fascinating species. And this is the golden crown flying fox. So this is found over in the Philippines. And this bat has almost a six foot wingspan. So that's really, really big when you think about that. And, uh, and so you have this huge bat in the Philippines. And it's actually, if you look at its face, does anybody want to guess what it eats? Um, after I, you know, I went over some of those facial characters and things that they eat. So it's got big eyes and a big nose. Do you think it's going to eat insects? Do you think it's going to eat fruit? Do you think it's going to drink nectar? Type that in the chat. I see nectar, I see fruit. Any other guesses out there? So blood, oh, there's another guess. So this is actually a fruit eating bat and um, they're actually specialists on figs. That's uh, mainly what they eat, but of course they'll eat other things. And I've seen some pictures on the internet of this giant bat with like a whole banana stuffed into its mouth. So they'll eat bananas and other fruits as well. So probably one of the most notorious groups of bats are the vampire bats, and there are actually only three species of vampire bats in the entire world, and they're found in Central and South America. So vampire bats are the only mammal species that feeds entirely off of blood. We call this sanguinous. 
And so to do this, they actually um, bite their victims. So they bite things like large mammals, like cows and sheep. And um, in their saliva, they have this protein that's an anticoagulant that causes that blood to flow. So they just lap up that blood. And interestingly enough, we've named the protein Draculin and it's been used medically to help uh, folks with like strokes and, and other blood clotting disorders, essentially. So this is something that vampire bats have helped with our medical um, technology and all of that. So they also have these um, really big ears to be able to echolocate and find their prey. Um, and they're actually, they take care of one another. So they don't care if, uh, if they're not related. If you're part of the colony, you're part of the family. And if one of them loses a baby, AKA a pup, and that female goes into mourning because she's upset about losing her baby, the other females in the colony will actually groom her and feed her blood, regurgitate blood and feed her just to take care of her until she's ready to go out and hunt again. So another cool thing about them, because they feed on the ground, um, they have to be able to fly really quickly. So they almost simultaneously drink and pee just because uh, they have to release waste to make them lighter in weight to be able to fly. And also they're one of the few bat species that can get a running start on the ground and be able to fly. So they'll run on all fours at like a little over one mile per hour, which is fast for a bat, but they run on all fours and use that to kind of get flight and, um, and fly. Most other bats have to be up high, like up on a trunk of a tree or something like that to be able to fly. So really, really cool bat species and I can talk so much more about them, but I've got to tell you about our local bats now. So in Maryland, we have 10 species of bats and we have three that essentially are on the way. And I say on the way because we've had some unconfirmed reports of three additional species. And those include the Seminole bat, the Southeastern myotis, and the Brazilian free-tailed bat, which is now in Virginia. So um, potentially some of these bats are moving northward with climate change and also with the loss of our local bat species. As I said earlier, all of our bat species are insectivores, which means that they eat insects. And most of them live in colonies. So they live in these large colonies, either throughout the summer or in the winter or both. Some of our bat species also migrate. And so bats like this Eastern red bat that you'll see pictured here, they actually um, can migrate down to South and Central America this time of year, or they can stay here over the winter. So I'm going to start with the Eastern red bat first, and I should have mentioned this on the previous slide, but we kind of break off our bats into two main groups. We have the tree bats, which are mostly solitary, and they tend to either migrate or go through short-term periods of hibernation known as torpor, and then we have the cave bats, which are the true hibernating bats, and they tend to be a lot more colonial and hang out with a lot of other bat species. So the Eastern red bat is my favorite local bat, just because they're so pretty. Um, they're a medium sized bat with reddish orange fur. They're probably one of the most common bats that you're going to see around Maryland. And the females have more of this grayish in color. So you can actually tell the difference between males and females based on their color patterns. Um, and this is actually a female with a baby or a pup uh, attached to her right there. So they have a fully furred tail and that they kind of wrap themselves up with. I'll show you a picture a lot, uh, later in this presentation where they use that tail to almost like a blanket, a furry blanket when they're going through that torpor. Um, they often spend you know, their summers in small family groups or by themselves. So they're mostly loners, except the females will raise young over the summer. And unlike other bat species, they can have uh, two to four babies at a time. And so that's a lot of babies to take care of by yourself, but they do it. So um, some red bats will migrate south in this time of year, and then others are going to overwinter under things like leaf litter. So typically the red bats are one of our first bat species to emerge um, after sunset. And they'll also sometimes forage during the day, particularly uh, essentially like in the winter time when we get some of those warm winter days and you see bats flying around, it's probably an Eastern red bat. 
So another cool bat species is this hoary bat. And um, like the red bat, it's another tree bat species. You can see this one here, this is a mom and she's got two babies, um, so two pups there. And you can see how furry their tails are. So you don't see hoary bats too much in Southern Maryland. They mostly pass through, but um, they are common out in Western Maryland in more of um, these conifer type forests. So they have this beautiful golden mantle around their faces, and then they have this silver frosted hair on the back. And um, they're typically, again, found in conifer forests. They tend to migrate a lot more than those eastern red bats. And so most of the hoary bats have already left for the season, but they'll come back early in March and April, um, come back up to Maryland. So like the red bat, they can have multiple young. They typically average two young at a time and their young can fly within five weeks of age. And these bats eat a lot of moths. So that is the most important food for them. If you've ever had a bat in the house, um, particularly if it was recently, it was most likely the big brown bat. So this is essentially our most common bat species in urban and suburban areas across Maryland. And that's because they're a highly adaptable species. Um, excuse me, like the eastern red bats, they're gonna emerge early in the night and they're very common bat to see flying out and about. They're large in size, um, relatively speaking, and they essentially have this um, darker brown coloration. They have a dark muzzle, so a muzzle is their nose. And um, the way to tell the difference between them and their sm slightly smaller cousins, the little brown bats, is that um, the muzzle is naked and black on the big brown bats. And that tragus, that little piece in their ear, is rounded on um, our big brown bats. Now, they don't have much bigger wingspan than our little brown bats. Um, so a lot of people, it's, you know, they see a big bat and they just assume it's a big brown bat. Um, it's probably, you know, good chance that the little brown bats aren't much smaller. They're only got an, uh, like less than an inch um, smaller wingspan than our big brown bats. So these are the bats that can eat up to a third of their weight in insects every night. And they frequently feed on um, pests in agricultural areas. So, um, so this is a bat that is going to be found a lot around human dwellings. You'll find them in barns and sheds and old buildings. And those females are going to form these really large maternity colonies in the summer. And occasionally, if you put up bat houses and you get residents, this is probably the most likely resident you're going to get in your bat colony or your bat house. So about 10, 15 years ago, if you had a bat in the house, it could have been either a little brown bat or a big brown bat. But now the little brown bats have really, really taken a nosedive, unfortunately, um, due to a disease, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, and that's called white nose syndrome. So little brown bats are, um, used to be one of the most common bats locally, but we've seen about 90% loss in a lot of areas of our little brown bat population since 2010 when white nose syndrome was documented in Maryland. So um, this has, you know, compared to the big brown bat, they actually have a hairy muzzle and it's not as dark and you can't really see their tragus, but it is pointed on the little brown bats. They also have long um, fur on their, their feet. So I used to joke they've got hobbit toes because they've got really furry toes. So these are um, bats that have about a wingspan around 11 inches and they tend to eat smaller prey. So if you want a bat that eats mosquitoes, this is your bat right here. So um, lactating, lactating females are females that have just given birth and are, are feeding young. They do seem to prefer larger insects like beetles and moths um, for prey, but um, they certainly will take care of mosquitoes and gnats and other small items as well. So this is one of our longer lived bat species. And um, some of the oldest little brown bats that have been documented were over 30 years old, which is really old for a small mammal of their size. They're a very, very tiny animal. Another bat species that used to be common, which unfortunately is not so common anymore, is the tricolored bat. And this is formerly known as the Eastern Pipistrelle. 
So the tricolored bat has kind of a yellowish color to its fur on its body and it has these black wings. And if you were to pull one of those hairs, you would see that they are tricolored. So they're dark at the base, whitish at the center and reddish brown at the tip. So they have these really pink forearms to them too. So, um, so they look very distinct to a lot of, um, compared to a lot of our other bat species in the area. And these used to be the, one of the most ubiquitous bat species across the United States until white nose syndrome hit. They live in small colonies um, and they tend to spend um, sometimes, you know, you will see individuals that will be hanging out on their own as well. So sometimes they are solitary or just will be hanging out in those small family groups. But in the winter, they like to form larger colonies with other species. And so these are the those true hibernating bats. And I forgot to mention the little brown bats and the big brown bats are also true hibernators. So they're gonna be hibernating in, in these larger colonies um, in, you know, in railroad tunnels, in caves. We don't have very many caves in Maryland, but sometimes in barns and attics and, and places like that. So the tricolored bat is one of our smaller bats and they have this like slow fluttering flight and they almost look like a moth, the way that they flap their wings. And if you're familiar with larger moth species like our giant silk moths, like the polyphemus moth and the luna moth, um, if you don't get a good glimpse of it, sometimes the tricolored bat can be mistaken for one of those. Unfortunately, our bats are under threat. So we just had um, a state of the bats report release a couple months ago, and it found that the majority of bat species around the world are declining and are declining due to a number of factors, but they're really in, in dire need. And so like many of our other species, habitat loss and degradation are big threats to our bat species. And I've already alluded to this, but there's also a disease like white nose syndrome, which is problematic for many of our bats. Um, in some areas of the world, those large bats, like those, um, that giant um, crowned flying fox, golden crowned flying fox, unfortunately they're overhunted or unsustainably harvested. And I won't get into this too much, but Bat taxidermy, um, especially online, being sold online, a lot of that is unsustainable and illegal trade of bats. And so that is contributing to the decline of some of those bat species in tropical areas outside of the United States. For our migrating bats, um, particularly the hoary bats, these wind turbines are problematic during migration season. And one of the reasons is they think that a lot of those hoary bats are kind of following those large trees <laughs> to navigate south. And if you've ever seen these um, big wind turbines, they're often in those migration routes and they're often the largest things. And so um, it's really the pressure change around those wind turbines that causes the problems for the bats, not necessarily hitting or running into the turbines themselves. Final threat to bats is disturbance as well. Um, so disturbing the maternity colonies in particular can cause a loss of all of the breeding for an entire season. And this happened a lot when um, caves were commercialized, particularly in the 50s and the 60s, and people put up lights and started doing year-round tours in some of these caves and in other areas. And that disturbed um, some of those bat species that used them as an overwintering habitat. So I've alluded to this um, disease and I'm gonna spend a couple slides talking about it, but this is white nose syndrome. And white nose syndrome is a fungal disease caused by this um, pseudogymnascus destructans um, fungus. And as of this, you know, today, it's been found in 40 states across the United States and eight Canadian provinces. It was first documented in Albany, New York in 2006. In Virginia, it was documented in 2009. And Maryland officially documented it in 2010. And you can just see it spread across the Eastern United States, but it's also made some major jumps. Um, so we know that it's being spread bat to bat. We also know that people are accidentally moving this around with caving equipment and clothing and things like that. What it does is it essentially disrupts hibernation. So these are the end stages of white nose syndrome. You see that white fuzzy mass coming out of the nose. That is actually the fungus. 
And what it does is it gets throughout the bat's body, particularly in the wings. So sometimes you'll see wing damage um, to these bats. And these wings have very thin skin and there's a lot of blood flow. And so the wings are really important for temperature regulation. And essentially this fungus gets all throughout their body and it itches and it causes them to wake up during hibernation. And when they wake up, they use their very precious fat stores. And essentially a lot of them are starving and dying um, over the, the hibernation period. So here's some data from Maryland Department of Natural Resources with my former colleague, uh, Dan Feller. He was the Western Region ecologist who was studying bats in Maryland for quite some time. So this is just the data in 2009 before uh, white nose syndrome was found in the state. And these are just from the hibernacula or the winter places that they visit or that he would study. So this isn't all of Maryland, but um, it's giving you a snapshot. You can see in 2009 that little brown bats and tricolored bats were the most common bat species found in those cave ecosystems. In 2010, when uh, white nose syndrome hit, we just see this precipitous decline with uh, bat populations in those caves. And we see some slight increases and those increases are actually the big brown bats which if you look at 2009, big brown bats were never a big part of those cave ecosystems. But in um, 2019, we see a very small increase there. And we think this is just because there were less bats using those cave ecosystems and some more big brown bats were taking advantage of it. But there's also a possibility that those big brown bats essentially were um, showing some resistance to this disease as well. So here's just some data from um, Western Pennsylvania from the National Park Service, and it's essentially showing you the same thing. So um, in their systems, the little brown bat and the northern long-eared bats were the most common bat species. And then after white nose syndrome, you can see those precipitous declines there. Um, and then when you pull out things like the big brown bats um, and the eastern red bats, you see that you know the big brown bats were never very abundant before white nose syndrome, but after white nose syndrome, you see some of that increase there. And you see a very small increase with those eastern red bats too. So what we know is essentially this is a fungus and it's got microscopic spores. And we know that somehow it's getting passed around with people and bat to bat contact. And so there are a lot of decontamination protocols that are in place to essentially prevent the spread of additional um, white nose syndrome across the state. And Dan Feller, his, um, his wife visited, uh, she was going on a, a work trip to I think Utah or something like that and they didn't have white nose syndrome there yet and he made her essentially throw out her boots and buy brand new boots just so it, she didn't have a chance to to have accidentally bring any white nose syndrome from maryland out there so um, in maryland and other states there is some um, some data that shows that big brown bats might be showing some resistance and it could be you know either a bacteria on their skin that is helping to protect them from that white nose syndrome but it also could be that they have a lot more fat than other bat species, and so they've got a lot more to lose. So we don't know quite yet why big, the big brown bats are just showing that you know resilience, but they have found that bacterial volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, can kill the fungus. And there was actually a banana researcher who was looking at ways to keep bananas on our shelves longer by using bacterial VOCs to kill fungus on bananas. And um, he reached out to folks working with bats and they were able to develop essentially a way to treat bats in hand. But the problem is, is we can't spray this stuff in these cave ecosystems. Number one, because they're very sensitive environments and fungus, there are natural fungi that are very important for those cave ecosystems. And number two is we don't know all of the cave ecosystems where these bats are utilizing, so we won't be able to treat all of them. But we do know if we do have bats in hand, that process can be used. UV radiation has recently been found to kill the virus, um, or sorry, kill the fungus, 
And so the next step is figuring out how long that radiation needs to, that exposure needs to happen to protect the bats. Um, and if that UV radiation is going to have any unintended consequences on bats. If you're familiar with UV radiation, that's what gives us things like skin cancer and all of that. So you don't want to, you know, essentially exchange white nose syndrome for other problems um, in, in that process. There is some uh, hope that there might be some vaccines that people are working to develop. People are also looking at ways to slightly mist bats with some of these compounds before going into their hibernacula. And one of the jokes that we had at my former job was to put out little tanning beds outside of bat caves to have them um, decontaminate themselves. <laughs> So let's talk about how we can help bats in our backyards um, in absence of, of white nose syndrome. And one of the biggest things we can do is actually to limit pesticide use because insects are super, super important for our bats. And so if we kill all the insects, we're inadvertently killing those food sources for the bats, or we could be poisoning their food sources, which is also problematic. Another thing to do, particularly this time of year, is to leave snags, which are standing dead trees, and the leaves, if it's not a threat to people, pets, and property. So those standing dead trees are really important for a number of wildlife species. I joke that snags are basically like wildlife condominiums. They're better than any birdhouse, bat house, or bee house that you can put up there. And if you can leave them up, you know, do so. So I had um, uh, recently, we had to have a chestnut oak taken down from our yard because it was a threat to falling on our house and the neighbor's house. Um, but we left up about 10 feet of that uh, tree to essentially just decompose in the yard because those 10 feet, if it fell, it wasn't going to destroy any important property but its decomposition is providing that habitat for a number of species there. So some of our bats will roost under um, bark or under logs and things like that. And um, the leaves are really important for species like our Eastern red bats. So this isn't a dead Eastern red bat. This is the one, like I said, they're using that, that furry tail essentially as a blanket and they'll curl up on themselves um, under leaf litter and they'll go through short-term periods of hibernation known as torpor. And so they can do that because their bodies are designed to go through those short-term periods and they need those leaves um, to be able to do that. Another really important thing you can do for bats uh, locally is to limit light pollution, which is problematic for a number of species. And light pollution is essentially all this unused light at night. So you can see different areas from space because the amount of light that we use. And this is problematic for not just bats, but also things like insects and birds that migrate and things of that nature. And so um, there are different ways to limit light pollution at night. You can put lights on timers. Um, you can put them on sensors. You're only getting the light when you need it. But you can also um, use these different types of lights, like shielded lights, to help prevent the amount of light pollution that's happening. So unshielded lights are just bulbs, and the light is just shining all around, when really you just need that light down below. And so the shields essentially are like the hoods on lights that are directing that light to where you want it to go. And so um, the best types of lights are ones where the bulbs are not directly visible. They're entirely shielded by whatever covering that you have, and it's directing the light where you need it instead of inadvertently throwing that light all around and wasting it. Um, so there are a lot of different resources out there. Florida actually has some great information about um, essentially wildlife friendly lighting solutions because they have a lot of problem with light pollution and nesting sea turtles down their way. You can find that information also on Dark Sky International. They've got a lot of great information and research. And this is something really easy that you can do in your own backyard to help a lot of different species. Another thing to think about is to avoid conflicts with bats because they really like our houses. They're kind of like, you know, the Hyatt hotels compared to the outdoors. And so um, bats are going to find their ways in. And, um, and so there are many different locations within your house 
that um, can be entry and exit locations for bats and other wildlife species. And usually, you know, if you've got an animal like a bat or a um, raccoon or a squirrel in your house, you've got, you know, a home improvement problem first and then uh, an animal problem second, essentially. So for bats, uh, most of the time they're going to be exiting right around dusk. And so if you have bats in your house, um, you can look and see where you see them exiting at night. And that'll show you those areas to seal up. So it's important to seal up the holes after the bats have left. And in Maryland, it's actually restricted at the time of year that you can do this. Um, between March through end of August, you actually have to get a permit to be able to exclude bats from your house. And that's just because, uh, and it's a free permit, but it's just because that's during bat breeding season. And we don't want to make sure that, uh, or we want to make sure that people aren't excluding bats and leaving baby bats in the house during that time. So I usually suggest uh, contacting a licensed wildlife cooperator and working with them to get that permit and doing that exclusion just so you can help those bats in the area. Certainly, if you get bats in there, you're gonna to have to clean up all that bat poop and the fancy science term for bat poop is guano and never, ever, ever handle a bat with your bare hands, always use gloves. And I like to show this picture of this bat. This was a big brown bat that got into the state capitol because they were doing improvements on the Annapolis Capitol building. And, you know, there were holes up in the top. So, uh, of course, the bat got in. So even the state house isn't exempt from getting bats coming indoors. So if you do um, exclude bats, one of the things you can do is provide alternative habitat for them. And I used to always talk about putting up bat houses to help bats. But we find that bats usually don't take to houses as easily as birds do. And most people have success with bat boxes when they exclude them from indoors in the house. They come back to that house to look for, you know, how to get in and, and all of that. So you're essentially giving them an alternative um, to roosting in your house by putting up these bat houses. There are different types of bat houses. This is um, like one of the flat bat houses. And this is one of the rocket style houses. The, the benefit of the rocket style houses is that bats can kind of move around as temperature um, changes throughout the day, whereas the front of the house would get the most direct sunlight. And if it gets a little too steamy, they can go to the back of the house and the rocket house. Um, so you really want to put these up in sunny areas, getting at least six to eight hours of direct sunlight. You should have them up no later than early March because that's when the bats are going to be coming out of hibernation and looking for a place to have their babies. And certainly talk to your neighbors before you put them up um, so, uh, so they know what you're doing. And it's really good to have multiple bat houses, um, particularly like one in direct sunlight and one in like indirect sunlight so they can have a choice between going between those houses and everything. Remember that these houses are open at the bottom, so essentially they're self-cleaning, but you don't want to put these bat houses under any places you're going to use, like under a walkway or something like, or over a walkway, because if you do get bat residents, there's going to be a lot of poop raining out of there, and occasionally baby bats will be coming out of it, and you just don't want that in your hair, right? Uh, <laughs> so think about that when you hang up these bat houses. If you do get lucky, um, report those roosts. There's a form on the Maryland Department of Natural Resources website just so they can keep track of where the bats are using these. And with that, that's all I got for you to talk about bats. Um, I'm gonna open it up to questions. So there's my contact information on the page as well. And I'm gonna post the link in the chat to the Maryland DNR bat page. Carrie, thank you so much for all that fascinating information. I shared in the chat that when we went to uh, Mammoth Cave about two years ago, we had to disinfect our feet on the way into the cave and disinfect on the way out. So they were also very uh, aware of the white nose syndrome. Uh, we had to walk through these, I don't even know how to describe it. It looked like a treadmill base full <laughs> of <laughs> um, chemicals. And then we had to with water. So we cleaned off and uh, they were very thorough and very particular about it. So that was good to see. Yeah, very good. 
Yep. And if anyone else has questions or thoughts to share, please feel free to turn your camera on, unmute yourself, or add anything to the chat. Um, I've had a bad night house before. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I've had bats in the house, too. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. You talked sure. about how um, there are a few species of bats that are moving north um, because of climate change, but also because we're losing some of our currently local bats. Mm -hmm. And, and why, what do you mean by that? Is that because there's less competition for roosting spaces? Is that essentially that, what that, for other reasons? They, I mean, it's not widely known why they're exactly moving north. So like the, the Brazilian free-tailed bats, also known as the Mexican free-tailed bats, they have only shown up in Virginia within the last, I think, five or six years. And so they're a much more southern species. And so they're st you're starting to see some northward progression. It could be from climate change, but also the lack of competition for those insect food resources could also be allowing for it. We're just not sure, um, you know, that if it's, you know, what's causing that range expansion. So the other two species, the Seminole bat and the um, southeastern myotis are also traditionally southern species that are starting to move northward. Do you also mind talking more about what the problem is with light pollution? What is it doing to the bats? Yeah, so the problem um, is dependent on some of the bats. The biggest problem is, is it affects insects and the, it's driving insect declines of certain species. And so that's limiting prey. Some bats are also light avoidant. Um, so bats like the, I think the little brown bat will avoid areas with lights. Whereas other bats like big brown bats are actually, they'll hunt under those lights. Um, during migration season, we do see problems with bats like eastern red bats in particular in our area. The light will disorient them and they run into to windows all the time. And so they're one of the most common window strike species that we have during migration periods. Um, and that also affects birds that are migrating too. So um, another thing is just turning off those lights during peak migration season will help the birds and the bats as well. Thanks. Welcome. I had a question for you about the windmills. You mentioned mm -hmm. that it's not necessarily striking the windmill itself, but it's the pressure. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I, it's very, I, I know very little about this, but um, the windmills around them apparently causes a, a significant change in air pressure. And so um, because bats have really, really small bodies, that pressure change is essentially crushing their internal organs. So um, it, it's, you know, people would ask me like, they're echolocating, why can't they notice that those windmills are there? And um, it's before they even get close to those blades where that, that zone of, of um, pressure change happens. So, um, so hoary bats, I think, are the most common bats that are getting hit locally by those wind turbines. And so there is some research that's gone into essentially changing up the speeds of the turbines during peak migration, just to allow for less of that pressure change and for less bat and bird mortalities. Um, and also there's some folks looking at different ways to site those wind turbines, but Essentially, the best places to put those turbines are where the most wind's going, and that's where those birds and bats are using. So that's where we have that kind of um, conflicting conflicts or conflicts of interest there. So. Well, hopefully they can find a solution that will work best for everyone. Yeah. When you were talking about the bat houses, have you ever had a, a birdhouse that bats have actually taken over? I have not seen any of that documented. Um, so when I worked at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and we started that roost survey page, I'll say that less than 20% of the bat roosts that were reported to us were in using those bat houses. 
And a lot of them were actually using um, behind people's shutters or attics or barns. So they were using a lot of those human structures. And one of the thoughts is that bats like to use these human structures because we've got a lot more temperature buffering happening. Um, if you've got like a barn or something like that, it's it holds the temperature a bit differently than than a freestanding bat house or a bird house. Um, so you know, if you think about like the rocket house on a pole, that's going to hold the temperature less than um, one of those flat bat houses mounted on the side of a house that is going to have that that buffering from the house essentially. I have um, known that you know. Southern flying squirrels will use bird houses though. So if you don't always hang up your bluebird houses out in direct sunlight or in a field, those uh, Southern flying squirrels and sometimes white-footed deer mice will take advantage of those. The only thing I've had inhabiting my bird house is a colony of wasps. <laughs> <laughs> and wasps will use the bat houses too. So um, sometimes they can coexist, but sometimes you also have to remove those wasp nests because they can get a little aggressive with the bats. You'd think they'd eat them, but not necessarily. Does anyone else have any questions or anything they'd like to share with Carrie? Okay, Carrie, I don't see any other questions for the evening. All right. Well, thank you all. Um, yeah. Stay batty. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was such a pleasure. So we really appreciate Bye. you joining us tonight. Bye. Have a good night. All right. Bye, Carrie. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Remember, our series runs once a month. Uh, so we'll see you again next month. Bye. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.